greets me with a gentle kiss. I think I'm blushing at that kiss, but it's really the warmth of the sun inviting my skin to come out and play. Quickly, that invitation is rescinded as a cloud passes in front of the golden orb in the sky we call the sun. The air smells like an oxymoron, like a crisp fluid. Wait, am I crying? No, it's just a snowflake melting on my cheek. This is the kind of day in which you'd see a brief glimmer of glitter-like flakes, or a rain shower comes just briefly enough on the hot afternoon to cool things down. This is the kind of day in which you should keep an eye on your favorite black mirror, like a locked phone screen or the back of a tinted car window or a scrying mirror. These are the kind of days that anchor my soul to the ground. You should keep an eye on those black mirrors because you just might see a glimmering rainbow-filled cloud dancing across the upside-down blue ballroom we call the sky. Days like this anchor my soul to this realm for a little while longer because I find it extremely hard to exist here. Not that my life has been hard. I've been extremely lucky and privileged throughout my whole life, but I find it hard to exist in that I find every day meaningless and depressing if there isn't something to learn or explore. Back in early 2017, I found myself with a research paper to write and no topic because up until then, what I was supposed to learn had been very heavily dictated, and I knew what was right and wrong. When I finally had a choice to, of what to study, I had no idea what to choose, because I had no idea what I actually valued about the world, so much that I could barely stay in it. That's because lacking a research topic was far from my only problem in early 2017 a feeling which I'm certain at least some of you out there share. I had recently ended my first serious relationship, which was a violently long exercise in compulsory heterosexuality. <laughs> I, <laughs> and in that same week, we had just ended the disastrous election cycle of 2016. <laughs> I really pack it all in there. Um, so, over that winter, I just became thoroughly entrenched in the meme-filled, nihilistic wasteland of social media. Over that winter, self-destructive tendencies added up and compounded in me landing in a behavioral health facility for a week in early February 2017. I was stuck in a place for the first time in my life without windows or fresh air for eight days. My only creative solace was the child safe art supplies. After seeing how much joy I got from creating beauty in a, way, in a world outside of weather, my therapists encouraged me to stick with art therapy upon release. But outside, I couldn't just stick with abstract representations of my emotions. It was neither magic nor medicine that had me noticing more beautiful stuff in the world. I just started giving myself permission to feel joy. I did that by calling my joyful fascinations a study in aesthetic approximation. Aesthetic approximation because I knew from things like the golden ratio and fractal patterns in nature that when we find something pleasing to our eye, we might have just stumbled on some really cool math. I took after the original scientific appreciators of beauty slash nerds uh, like <laughs> Da Vinci and started writing my observations down in a notebook. So I was filled with math scribbles and all kinds of other doodles for a while. So, the great work began, taking my own joy seriously. I think all of you should join me in that work, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know why. 
So when I was doing this journaling, I kept finding one pattern showing up. These really cool rainbow-like clouds were dancing around the sun or the moon. The lights in here are a little bit splashing on the projector, but I promise there's some really cool solar coronas happening up here. Um, <laughs> so I was really surprised when I saw these because cloud iridescence, this phenomenon, is pretty rare globally, but it's not rare here in Asheville, North Carolina, if you know where to look. A certain relationship exists between the, the waves of the land, which we call mountains, and the waves of the sky, which we call weather, to result in, I'll spare you the fancy big words, but pretty rainbow colors in the sky. Um, so I kept recording these because I was like, there's no way I'm actually seeing this this many times. But there was. I found other research, like in Boulder, Colorado, where this had happened a lot more often. So I chose this as my topic for my research paper, but I didn't stop there. It was so inspiring that I kept working on it as an independent undergraduate research project. I had finally trusted the process of believing in my own joy and taste for beauty. And that led to what some would call success. What success is that? Well, it's my research on gay clouds. That's, <laughs> that's right, um, gay clouds. Gay as in they inspired something jovial and childlike in me. But also gay as in the rainbow clad spectrum of LGBT folks who've always contributed tons to science and math. These clouds became my research muse. And I had a feeling it went deeper than my need to assert the absolute queerness of how the atmosphere works. Queer in all the ways. And for that to make sense, I have to explain my research just a little bit. So this cloud iridescence, we've always known, not always, meteorologists are well aware that this is a result of light wave interference from diffraction. That's big ways to say some other things. So first, let's break that phrase down real quick. Light. The light we're working with here is incoming solar radiation. It's got the full visible spectrum, which you see between 450 and 750 roughly on this chart, and a lot of infrared radiation as well, which we commonly know as heat. Um, this light can be split up into every constituent color you can think of, and that's important because it will get split up. And that's due to its wave-like nature. So I like to think of wavelength of light as how big of a step a color can take. Let's imagine two people walking around a corner. The red the red longer wavelengths or bigger steps will end up swinging way out away from the corner and end up a little farther out. The shorter blue wavelengths end up taking tiny steps and hugging the corner. And so, as you can see in this GIF on the right, the blue swings way in closer and the red goes out more. And you can see on that left half of that right GIF <laughs> that they interfere and make cool patterns. So what is interference? Interference is the red and blue that are swinging around different corners running into each other to make it look like purple happened there. But it's not just limited to red and blue. We're working with the full spectrum, remember? So it creates a series of rainbows that happen in all kinds of interference patterns. So what are those other interference patterns? This is what I originally noticed. I said these clouds look like a big oil slick in the sky. We see them come up in like motor oil on concrete or soap bubbles or even the little birefringence uh, inclusions in crystals and also in diffraction, which is the bending of light around a water droplet. Other physicists are using this to get good data about the medium in which the rainbows occur. 
I was like, why aren't meteorologists doing this? After all, we're always looking for more microscale data. Uh, <laughs> um, I, so I was like, come on, get it together. Um, <laughs> so with my formula, I took the properties of the ideas behind that last chart I showed you and put it into the context of a cloud. Instead of trying to figure out how thin or thick our thin section is, we're trying to figure out how big a water droplet is. With a few assumptions that go along with the context of this beautiful picture, you can put all the things you can get from seeing a cloud on the left-hand side, that's that sine theta over 2 and lambda, and then you put the output on the right-hand side which is um, some, a bunch of different scientific constants wrapped together in my constant, the heart constant, and times pressure and the natural log of relative humidity. Um, that's all to say, picture goes on the right, numbers go on the left. So through this, we don't get just a vague description of this cloud formed in this kind of way. We get a dynamic and data-rich view of the cloud's history. We get a history of each little water droplet and not just a general region. Every single point in that cloud is a point we can get data from. And that's really important because it makes a field of tiny weather sensors in the sky that we can now get data from. Now, to non-meteorologists, a field of tiny weather sensors in the sky might sound like dystopian overkill. But this is what we would do if it was possible. We're already getting a lot of data from weather towers all over the country and world in order to inform our output maps. Meteorologists kind of do the opposite of what I did here. They usually take numbers from those weather stations all over the world and make aesthetically pleasing output maps that give us an idea of the atmosphere. My formula flips this input-output relationship so that we take a beautiful picture and can get relevant data from it. I want you to know that your own complex history is just as important to humanity as each water droplet's history is to a cloud. We are all subject to the same forces, but at different times, on different sides, and in different amounts, with different histories informing our reactions than each other. The way you react to a certain situation is your own record of complex human history. And when we share our histories with each other, our senses are no longer bound to the task of just informing our own reality. We become part of a beautiful network of observers, just like the network of meteorological instrument towers all over the world. We become part of our own map, our own cloud with each other. Apply your readings to a bigger data set so we can better inform our collective reality. I am so happy to tell you that for me, these clouds are gay. <laughs> gay as in something that finally makes me happy. Something that I was never told was an option, but ended up being one anyway. And gay as in the interfering and interlacing definitions of class, race, gender, and sexuality that informed my history and identity. I hope you find something that crystallizes your own narrative. I hope you find something that endlessly makes you curious. I truly hope you find your own gay cloud and share it with the world. Thank you. Thank you.